organizers uh, requested a topic that's a very, it's not, I don't know if it's a great topic for a first time back to product, because it's a pretty tough topic. Um, and you know, I want to be honest with you, it can be a little demoralizing. So I, I want to make sure that nobody leaves uh, you know, depressed <laughs> about product. Um, it's no secret that most transformations fail. I mean, at this point, you read about them every single day. And uh, there are some that do succeed. But the truth is, a lot of things have to go right to succeed. And I'll be honest, a lot of the things are outside of your control. They're more like the CEOs. Most of this talk, honestly, is for CEOs. And I've given this talk to several CEOs. That's, they're, they're like right at the top of the reasons. But... Yeah, they, yeah, it's not a secret. I, I am going to try to um, summarize the main things that cause transformations to fail. Um, I, I broke that into two groups. Two, the first group are things that come from outside of the product and technology organization, outside of product management, product design, engineering. And then the second group are the things that come from inside. I'll be honest, the ones on the inside are a lot easier to fix. But I also want to start by making sure you know that it can happen and that it, what, what the benefit is. So I won't spend time really, I don't really want to waste the time on my background. You can always Google it if you want. Let's, um, let's get into this, because everybody talks about transformation, but it's just it's a buzzword at this point. The way I like to frame it, whenever anybody cal- tells me, oh, we've transformed, I want to like, Okay, like what could you do now that you couldn't do before? I mean, isn't that the point of this stuff? What could you do now that you wouldn't be able to do before? By the way, the pandemic served as a proof point for many companies that had claimed they had transformed about whether they really could. Like, could they adapt? There are several, there are many companies that are no longer with us. The companies have gone out of business because of the pandemic. There are other companies that not only saved themselves, but huge increases in value. And so that made it very clear in many cases. But to me, that's the real test. Is there, can you, because what do you, the reason we transform how to, to become like the best companies is to be able to take advantage of opportunities I mean, isn't that what it really means to be agile? People see, say agile, but of course, m- for most people, that is a stupid saying. It just means that they're following a process now that they weren't following before. The real question is, can they do something? Can they take advantage of an opportunity that's there that they wouldn't have been able to take advantage of before? That's what we're looking for. And that's the litmus test that I use. In every company I cite as a successful transformation, I start by saying, and here's how they proved it. Proved it to themselves, proved it to me, proved it to the world. All right, um, this is one of my favorite uh, stories of a company that successfully transformed. I mean, the fact that they're still here today is kind of a, mi- a miracle. Uh, the company is The Guardian that many of you know, they're based in the UK. Do you know that last year they celebrated their 200th birthday? So it was, they were founded in 1821. And they survived, what, two world wars? They survived, but what almost killed them actually was the internet. And uh, because if you know the media business, and many of you do, Ships does here, the media business, the internet just tore into the media business. So. Uh, eBay took a lot of their revenue, Craigslist took a lot of their revenue, (laughs) dating sites took revenue, job sites took revenue, there's almost nothing left. And luckily, and you know, the the Guardian was actually funded by a trust, there's a whole history there that's interesting, but their board, when they saw what was happening, they made the the life-saving decision, they brought in a woman onto their board named Judy Gibbons, who is one of the crown jewels of the United Kingdom. She, uh, she is a former Apple and Microsoft executive. I actually profiled her in the new book, Empowered, if you're interested. She's known her for a long time. We both started at the same time as developers at HP Labs. And she's, she got joined their board, and not just joined the board, they put her as chair of the board. 
and she drove that transformation. So that was the first thing done right, by the way. Was, so of course, when you're board chair, you can dis decide everything, including the CEO. And uh, anyway, they, they got to work. And you know, they had almost no kind of technology. They had a little group that basically would take a, uh, uh, an article written by a journalist and wrap a little HTML around it and put it on a website. And they had really no technology uh, power. So they created a group. It wasn't a big group, but it was a very good group. Uh, and I, I'm actually, this story is a little later. I'm, I'm not going to spend the time on their whole transformation process. But to, to illustrate what it means to successfully transform. So this group, when they were getting going, they, they got lucky. The iPhone came out. This was a perfect vehicle for them. And because they had built these skills, they had actually t uh, created what Apple com considered the top iPhone news app in the world, the, the uh, Guardian app. They had done some things that made it work a lot faster. And I won't go into it, but it was what Apple considered the best. And because they considered it the best, they promoted it all over, especially you know, on their store which was critical for The Guardian because they had no money for marketing. So this was important. But that's not really the story. And I just want to point out that, uh, that app, The Guardian News app, five people, three engineers, a product manager, and a designer. So important. Don't need big teams for this stuff. But anyway, uh, the product manager on that team is a guy named Jonathan Moore. It started at the BBC. And John, I've known Jonathan since he was at the BBC. But anyway, he uh, gets a call from his contact at Apple and says, I can't tell you why, but get on a plane and come to Cupertino. And see, when Apple asks that, you, you get on a plane. And that's what he did. <laughs> and he showed up and they said, well, here's why you're here. We're about to announce a new device, which was the iPad. It, and Steve Jobs has personally... Uh, encouraged us to invite The Guardian to create a new app for this device. Because he thinks you created the best news app for the iPhone, he wants you to create something awesome for the iPad. And they said, no promises, they never do that, but if you create this app, they promised that they would show it to him, Steve Jobs, and if he liked it, he would feature it on stage. But only if he liked it. So Jonathan goes back and he says, well, the good news is we have this amazing opportunity. The bad news is we have seven weeks to create an app. Seven weeks. And by the way, this is an all new device, all new SDK, new gestures, new everything. So their news app wasn't really, they needed, this, isn't, this was a different kind of thing. Uh, Jonathan was struck by how good it displayed images. By the way, they didn't even send him back with a prototype iPad. It took another couple weeks to get a device to test on. But they gave them the SDK and they had what they needed. And so the first thing they had to do was decide, could they sign up? Apple wanted to know, are you going to submit an app or not? That's called a high integrity commitment. They did some uh, analysis of the SDK. They did some quick prototyping. And the other thing they did is they, um, he realized that the Guardian had an amazing asset of images. They had a photography editor that gets photos of all over the news of the world. And the, the funny thing was, in, in a print newspaper, images are terrible, still terrible. And so they had these images, but they hardly used them. And so he went to the photo editor and said, what if we created a new app that just told the news through photos, through photos? And that was the idea. It was called Eyewitness. And each day, there was a whole production business operations behind it. Every day, the photo editor would choose a photo from the news of the world. The photo editor would then go to the uh, editorial team and say, we need a, a, a story, a small story to written, which is going to be on the back of the photo. So you need a journalist to write that story. Uh, that has to be edited, of course, too. And then, if you'll notice, actually, oh, that image is not clear enough, but... Um, on that, there's actually a sponsorship. So they knew they could make some money on this too. So they got Canon, the, the photo company, and they made it so that the, the photo editor would collect from the photographer the actual details of the image. Because these were amazing images. And anyway, they put all that together. And every single day, you'd open your app, and a new story 
about news of the world would be there. They, uh, they prototyped that, they did, I'm not gonna go into product discovery, but they did a lot of prototyping, a lot of testing on users, a lot of testing on the editorial team, and they got to the point where they were like, yes, this is good. They, um, they, were, they did the actual build of a product and then they had to submit it to Apple, but before they submitted it to Apple, they asked, uh, they were nervous about this big thing, gonna be a lot of uh, visibility, so they asked, for um, an emergency board meeting. And they got Judy and the rest of the board together and said, look, we were given this opportunity. We're about to submit this to Apple, but we wanted to make sure you were okay with that. And their only feedback was, how in the world did you get a 200-year-old company to do an entire new app in seven weeks? Now, if you have to think about it, most companies I know, even really good companies, even a Google, even an Amazon, they would struggle to do something like this in seven weeks. But they did. By the way, that was the same team. Three engineers, one product manager, one designer. And what was amazing, you know, they don't tell you. You submit the app, Apple never <laughs> says anything. But they're all watching at the uh, debut, and Steve Jobs is on stage, and he just says, he introduces the iPad, and he just goes and he brings up New York Times, USA Today. He just scroll, swipes them right off, just like, yeah, we have all these apps. And then he stops at Eyewitness. And he said, this is what this device is all about. And what was amazing was, for the first year of iPad sales, almost every single person that bought an iPad installed iWitness. And think about that for a company that's hanging by a thread. So that's why you transform, so that you could take advantage of opportunities like that. And that's what they did. That's why they're still here, 600 journalists to keep paid is not easy. Yeah, so that's what we mean by transformation. If, if a company shows me they can do things like that, I'm like, okay, you, you've got skills. That's what we're trying to do. All right, so what does that really mean? The foundation of these skills is empowered product teams. What I described, that, that Jonathan was a product manager on a strong product team. They were given a problem to solve and they went and figured it out. So let's talk about those teams. That's not the, what I'm really gonna talk about in this talk is why companies don't create these teams. But it, we need to be on the same page as to what we're talking about. So there's really just three things. And I, by the way, I'm going fast because I have a ton to talk about. <laughs> and so stop me if I go too fast. But uh, there are really three things. First of all, do you have a cross-functional team of the right skills? So notice in that uh, Guardian Eyewitness team, there was a product manager, there was a true product designer, they had three engineers, that was a full product team. The product manager worked with editorial, worked with commercial, the designers worked both on the user side and the experience overall, and then the engineers, of course, the whole range of technology. So a cross-functional team of competent people with the necessary range of skills. I would argue the biggest thing they, they did over most companies is they had a competent product manager. We're gonna talk about that. Second, the team is actually assigned problems to solve rather than features on a roadmap. So what of course could have happened in most not very good companies is the executives get together, in this case maybe editorial executives get together, create a roadmap of these are the things I want you to build and then they would hand it off to a team to build. First of all, by the you'd never get anything in seven weeks, but even so, you'd probably get a pretty bad solution. In this case, they were given a very clear problem to solve, and they were empowered to figure out the best way to do it. Why do you empower a team? Because the engineers are working with the en uh, in enabling technology every day, and they're testing this with real users every week. The whole idea is they're in the best position to figure out the best solution. So that's the second. And third, in an empowered team, they are accountable. In other words, just because they ship something to Apple doesn't really matter. What matters is that Apple loved it and promoted it, and so they got this outcome that they needed. So we don't, you know, obviously shipping things is important, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. On an empowered team, we're held accountable to results. So that's what we mean by an empowered team. Now, there's three things that turns into in practice. And, and this, is, 
this really should be a whole hour right here on these three things, because this is what makes good product teams. Well, I'm really cutting to the chase here. It's not about whether they're agile. It's not about whether they're Scrum or Kanban or XP. It's not about process at all. It's about these three things. When I meet teams, if these three things are going on, I know it's a good team. If not, it's a problem. So the first is, are they addressing the risks of the product early? What, what early means is before you have your engineers write a line of code. The four risks, is it valuable? Will people choose to use it? Second, can they use it if they want to use it? Is it usable? Third, can we build it? Do we have the technology to build it? Do we have the skills on the team to build it? Do we have the time to build it? And finally, is it viable? What that means is, is this something, say, in their case, editorial can support? Is it something that's legal? Is it something that's compliant? Is it something that we can market, we can sell? Uh, in this case of that eyewitness, is it monetizable? They were able to work with a, a sponsor. That's what we mean by viable. If we're, we don't want our engineers to spend even a day building something if we don't believe these four have good answers. Most teams don't do that. Most teams, what they do is the product manager makes something up, puts it on a backlog, and the engineers build it, and then you find out later it was not good. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. That's classic Agile right there. Second, how are they actually solving problems? There's fundamentally two ways to do that. The old way is sequentially. What that means is somebody, it might be an executive, it might be a customer, a prospective customer, but usually it's a, a product manager defines requirements. Those can be captured in user stories or in a lot of companies they're still captured in a product requirements document, a PRD. But anyway, a product manager says, this is what it needs to do. And then they give that to a designer. And, the des and they are, tell the designer, we need workflows for this. So give me some wireframes, give me some annotations, give me the assets that are gonna be in the front end. And then that whole mess of requirements and designs is provided at sprint planning to the engineers. And the engineers are asked, like, how many sprints is this? Is it one, two, five, whatever. What I just described, I just cited agile ceremonies, right? Sprint planning. That's complete waterfall. That's literal waterfall, what I just described. And it's got all the problems of waterfall. And of course, good product teams don't work that way. What we, the way they solve the problems is collaboratively. There is a product manager that understands the value is issues and the viability issues. You have a designer that understands the usability issues, engineers that understand the feasibility issues, and together they come up with that solution, just like happened in that eyewitness scenario. In fact, that is the way most good apps are done today. It's the opposite of waterfall. In, a, the, in fact, more often than not, the engineers are the ones bringing to the designer and the product manager the new things they can build. Because there are new APIs come out constantly from all kinds of sources, not just Apple, not just you know, uh, Google or Microsoft. And then they say, we can now do this. And the designers then create an experience around that. And the product manager makes sure that experience is viable for the business. So that's the opposite of product manager defining requirements. In fact, I would argue requirements cause much more damage than good. Most requirements are not requirements. They're, they're in somebody's head. I'm just as guilty of this. Early on in my career, I wrote those documents too. And, and for a while there, I even believed that they were good things to build. But they're not. That's not how good products come. This is the little secret in, in tech products is the innovation doesn't come from customers, it doesn't come from product managers, it comes from your engineers. So if your engineers aren't there at conception of these ideas, you're wasting your engineers. This is why nothing makes me more angry than when I see a big company where they outsource their engineers. I, I've started this very sarcastic comment to CEOs where I say, well, do you think they should outsource the CEO? Because <laughs> to me, it's just as ridiculous. It's just as ridiculous. All right. 
And then the third is that, are they measuring themselves by the result, or are they just saying we shipped this feature on this date? So many people get so hung up on roadmaps and dates and deliverables, and they miss the point. And, and frankly, I understand it's a lot easier to deliver on date, on time, easy. It's not hard, you just shrink to fit. I mean, we all learned this early on, you shrink to fit. You cut whatever functionality, you cut whatever QA, you do whatever you need to do so that it hits the date. And of course, it's a very empty victory because it doesn't really please anybody. All right, so those are the three things. If those three things are going on, it's a good team. If not, you know, this is, this is what it means to transform, really. It's not about moving to Agile. <laughs> it's much harder than that. So let's quickly, I don't, because each one of these could be probably a half an hour, each one of these items. I, I had to force myself to narrow each of these two lists down to 10 common problems. So there's a lot of, I mean, and I've seen every one of these. My guess is several of you have seen many of these as well. Reasons why companies don't transform. I want to start with the things that are external to product and technology. So the first one is the company's just addicted to command and control management style. The first, the first, this is the very, very common. I mean, command and control is sort of the term we use. The old, that's where waterfall comes from. That's where roadmaps come from. It's like leaders saying, it's our job as a leader to, to make the decisions and pass down instructions. That's why they're called feature teams. They're there to implement the features that other people request. That's not an empowered product team. That's another talk we can go into, the problems with feature teams. But I'm assuming if you're interested in tra what transformation really means in practice for most companies is moving from feature teams to empowered product teams. You know, my whole thing is the difference between how the best companies work and the rest. And what I, the main theme that you find in all the best companies is they have empowered product teams. That's the, that's the key theme. They have lots of differences in culture. They have differences on like, some like to hire college hires and give them a lot of coaching. Other ones like to hire very experienced people, and whatever. The key is they're all, that they believe in this model of empowered product teams. And so, if the leaders are addicted to command and control, they really insist on giving directions down, making the decisions for the teams, you know, it's pretty much dead on arrival. So, this is one of those things we have to have an honest talk with the CEO and the C-suite about the differences. Uh, it's the difference between command and control and what Netflix calls lead with context, not control. All right, another one, really common by the way I see in Europe, I have a little editorializing about Europe as I go here, but so often a CEO will just, assign, you know they get pressure from their board, we gotta transform. So what do they do? They designate somebody as chief digital officer. That's a bad sign. It's really a bad sign. That's the CEO saying, I don't want to deal with it. I want to be able to tell the board, we've got a chief digital officer, I've done my job. It's not that, you know. Why doesn't it work? The main reason it doesn't work is this, a little bit of politics, but this is what you see. The, the uh, changes that have to be made to product design and engineering, which are substantial, don't get me wrong, but those are easier. And what happens is, those teams will make the changes. They can make the changes they need to make. But if the other stakeholders in the company are not on board, it's a bunch of passive, aggressive resistance. You go to that vice president of international or the vice president of merchandising and say, you know, that person is used to giving directions, giving roadmaps. And now you're saying, well, we're working a little differently now. <laughs> we're working together collaboratively. They're like, yeah, no, not interested in that. And so they go to the CEO. Uh, if you go to the CEO and the CEO says, well, that's the chief digital officer's problem. And it just doesn't get done. So one of the clear lessons I've learned is if this isn't driven by the top of your company, it almost certainly won't happen. 
Another common one is CEO just goes and hires McKinsey or Bain or BCG. And you know what they really want is to be able to tell their board, look, we're doing all this stuff. And they, we, look, we spent millions of euros on it. These, those, it's really sort of, it's called cover your ass. You know, just, it doesn't help. And those companies don't know anything about product companies. I have never seen anything useful come out of that when it comes to a transformation. <laughs> but they charge millions. This is probably the best example of the emperor has no clothes I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. All right. Another really common one, especially if you have a direct sales organization, SaaS company, um, sales is used to driving. Sales is used to saying, like, I've got a prospect, they need these things, this is better be our roadmap. And of course, um, it's really not, I always tell product people, it's not sales fault. Sales is, they're on commission, they're trying to feed their families. If they don't have good products, they are going to do this. This is usually a sign of product not being strong. Now, the main way we turn that around, that dynamic, is providing a strong product organization. And the main way this is, this is fixed is with what's called reference customers. Reference customers are everything in um, a direct sales organization. A reference customer is somebody that is using your product, they paid for it for real, no, no little deals to get them to be a reference. They have to pay for it for real, they're using it in production, and they love it enough that they're willing to tell other people how much they love it. Th those reference customers are everything. If you don't have those reference customers, sales is gonna agree to all kinds of crazy things. And it's kind of your fault. All right, marketing-driven product. Luckily, we don't see this as much, but there are, a, there are quite a few old-school chief marketing officers that think that marketing's job is to interact with the customers, and they tell then product what to build. Uh, and if you run into that, that is very much the antithesis of this. Oh, one of the things we usually do is to explain um, and to the leadership team that in tech products, that is not how any of the good products are created. What they need to understand is that the reason that doesn't work is that customers and marketing, our own executives, they don't know what's just now possible. So that's why focus groups don't work. That's why marketing-driven product doesn't work. That's why sales-driven product doesn't work. Our job, like Jeff Bezos likes to tell the product teams, your job is to invent great solutions on our customer's behalf. He can't tell them what to build. The customers can't tell you what to build. And there's another dimension with tech products, which is none of us really know what we want, even us, ourselves, until after we see it. That's why good companies do so much prototyping. They need to see it before they decide what they really want. If you're not doing constant prototyping, all I can tell you is you're not doing good product. All right. Another problem is actually the CFO, Chief Financial Officer. They are often out of uh, very, you know, very old school where they want project-based funding. They want to be able to say, okay, I'm willing to fund this project or this feature if you tell me how much money we're going to get out of it and how much it's going to cost to build, which of course is uh, a business case. And there's nothing wrong with a business case if you actually knew the answers to those questions. But we don't, and we can't. So project-based funding and staffing is not what a good product company does. And sometimes you have to really sit down with a CFO. I, I know I have sat down more times than I can count with CFOs. And usually I start by, tell, tell me, how, how well did your project-based funding work last year? Let's talk about it. You funded all these business cases. Let's go look. You tell me. You do the looking and you tell me how many of those things actually met the objectives you had, met the goals you had. Almost none. So it's like, so you need to realize this is not working for you. And so let's talk about how a good company does this. Again, transformation impacts finance, it impacts marketing, it impacts sales, it even impacts HR. Um, the HR didn't make my top 10 list, but it's there. Uh, Predictability-driven. 
there are so many companies that all they really care about is they were like, I want to know when this is going to happen. It's like the time, the when. They don't really even care what it is. They just want to know when because they really want to plan. And I, I understand the desire to run a business and plan, but the when is secondary to the what. We have to make sure we're going to actually have something customers want to buy, customers will actually love. So predictability is easy to get, but very dangerous. All right. This is a deep one that you find in CFOs often. You find them in CIOs. This is a real problem in CIOs. And one of the differences in, in general, one of the differences in Europe versus the US I see is a lot of times technology reports to a CIO here. In a, in a good product company, they, you don't report to a CIO, you report to a CTO. And the main difference is a CIO runs a cost center. A CTO runs a profit center. You really couldn't get much different than that. It's a very different mindset. And then I mentioned how much I hate this one, but you know, if, an, if a team, if a company is outsourcing their engineering, they need to really understand why that's so broken. But I, what I usually do is I ask the, I ask the CEO, like, tell me one of your favorite products. You know, whether it's an iPhone or I just had one recently tell me an Alexa device or it could be whatever. I'm like, you know how they did that? That idea didn't come from planning. It came from the engineers. I mean, literally. <laughs> uh, and almost always, that's where it comes from. And I'm like, do you think that happens if you outsource your engineers? They're not even paid to suggest these things. They're paid to build whatever you tell them to build. In fact, they usually, if they go to the person who asks them to build and say, I think this is a dumb thing to build, they're usually looking for a job. All right. And then, of course, overwhelming tech debt. You know, tech debt is a very serious problem no matter what. This is the one that will show up on the internal list as well. Tech debt kills companies. It gen generally kills uh, CIO-driven companies a lot more often than CTO driven because CTOs view this as their, this is their baby. Their code base is what powers the company. CIO just views it as a bunch of paid code. All right. So those are pretty big problems. And this is what I mean by it can be depressing. Any of those can, can kill your chances at transformation. All of these can be overcome, but uh, you know, if you really want to know what are the common pitfalls to transformation, you asked. All right. There are a bunch of things, though, that come from inside the organization, too. And we have to address those, even though I'll admit these are usually easier, easier to address because we're, they're in our control. This is a huge one. Uh, it's actually a big one all over the world, but especially in Europe. I have been, over the last couple of years, I have been on a tirade because Europe seems to be in love with process. And this, it just kills me. Um, I gave this talk yesterday in Bergen, and it was very much around like all these quotes from Elon Musk, from Bezos, from Steve Jobs about how dangerous process is. Elon Musk likes to say, you know, the problem with process is it's a substitute for thinking. <laughs> Steve Jobs goes into a big tirade about how there's process people and there's product people. If your process people become the boss, you're in trouble. And that's what happens usually. The politics becomes such that the process people get promoted in bigger companies. And I'm really talking about like, who teach, who's doing most of the training of your product managers in Europe? Agile coaches. Do agile coaches have any clue what they're talking about? No, they don't. These are the worst people to be training. And, and I have been struggling with all these product owners. First of all, product owner is a role in a process. It's not a job. If anybody has the title product owner on your LinkedIn profile, do yourself a favor <laughs> and fix that. You, you know, we don't need product owners. When I tell people in Silicon Valley, they literally don't believe me when I tell them how many Europeans 
have the title product owner. Like, companies pay just for a product owner? It's like, seriously, that's 10% maybe of the job. But the worst part isn't that, because the worst part is they're, they're coming into the job with the wrong expectations. They think their job is to administer the backlog in JIRA. That is not the job. That's part of our tasks. It's just as ridiculous as an engineer. Do you think they go to a scrum class and that makes them a software engineer? It's just as ridiculous. Just like us, they have to spend time in JIRA too. They don't like it any more than we do, but they have to spend time in there. It's just part of the job, right? We have to use whatever tool, but it isn't the job. Their job is to architect code solutions. Just like product, the job is to come up with a solution that's valuable and viable. So there is a real problem. And it's even worse when you look at these processes, because you know, Scrum and Kanban are one thing, but when companies start pitching safe, you're in big trouble. I mean, I'm literally, I cannot point to a single good product company that uses safe. That should scare you if you're using it. So, but why would anybody do that? It's because process gone wild. They have confused the role of process. Yes, you like safe. No. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, uh, is it a bit ironic that safe is a process and I believe Europe, according to yourself, is more prone to processes because the processes in themselves feel safe no, absolutely. Did everybody catch that? You said it clearly. Yes. Uh, the question was, uh, you know, maybe safe is so successful because it makes people feel safe. Remember what? process safe. Processes feel safe to people. Oh, processes in general. It's yeah. also true that that particular process is all about predictability. You heard me say earlier, one of the big dangers is addiction to predictability. Yes, process is a crutch for so many people. And uh, that's a, that is another talk, which is one of my favorites to give. It's not particularly this one, but process, uh, it, I'm not advocating no process, but I am saying process needs to serve us, not the other way around. And this is, um, it is a real problem. I mean, I, I want to be honest, it's a problem in a lot of the, the world, but for whatever reason that I don't really understand, it seems to have really taken hold here, in, especially in Northern Europe. So maybe somebody can explain to me the reasons for that. I'm just observing it. We're afraid to disagree. I, <laughs> can you just clarify that SAFE is like what scaled Agile framework is? Because I'm not sure everybody knows what that term is. Oh, yeah, well, the, you heard the question. The, um, so there are, it's, it really frustrates me because it's completely disingenuous. It stands for Scaled Agile Framework. It is not agile in any way, shape, or form. That is pure <laughs> marketing. Literally, it's pure marketing. And, you know, of course, CIOs, they don't care. They just like, oh, I get predictability. It goes back to waterfalls, quarterly releases. Anybody tells me their quarterly releases and they're agile is like, I'm calling bullshit on that. That is not true. If you're not releasing at least every two weeks for every team, forget it. You're not getting any of the benefits of Agile. So it's a marketing ploy that unfortunately has worked very well, remarkably well. I was with a, a, a safe coach recently and I asked him, I asked him literally, have you seen any company deploy it successfully? His answer was no, I haven't. But he said, but this is where all my revenue comes from. <laughs> they have created a machine. They really, they have created a brilliant machine and it appeals to the CIOs. And honestly, I don't have too much sympathy. Companies that are dumb enough to go that direction, they kind of get what they deserve. And my view is, okay, all of you working at a company, that's, you go disrupt them, go take their customers. That's what's happening across the industry. Good companies are disrupting the bad. So I do feel sorry for the people that are there, but okay. All right, so this is a real problem though, inadequate product managers. If you're a product owner and not a product manager, that's an issue. 
And the first thing you can do to help your company and your career is learn how to be a product manager. Honestly. And change your title on your LinkedIn profile. I, you do not want a job title that's a role in a process. So you don't want to say, I'm a scrum master. You can be a delivery manager that is also covering the role of scrum master, just like a product manager covers the role of the product owner, but you don't want a role defined in a process. This is a hard one, but I feel like this is definitely another emperor wears no clothes thing. All right, this is another problem that um, the engineers just want say they just want to coat. Um, now, I honestly don't really know too many people I can cite that say that, but a lot of people tell me that their engineers say they just want to coat. Of course, product depends on engineer. We say if you're just using your engineers to code, you're only getting about half their value. The other half comes from their participation in figuring out what to build, not just implementing. Now, we don't need all the engineers that way, but we need at least one on every product team. So we need to make sure we have that. Most of the good product companies out there, when they hire engineers, they try hard that they're not getting these types. So they interview for it. But I will say, even in some of my favorite companies, they'll occasionally make an exception. Some engineer that just loves, say, massive scale or fault tolerance or something, and doesn't really worry about you know, what's going to be built. They want to go deep on that. That's OK. Companies do fine with that. But if you don't have at least one senior engineer that cares just as much about what they build, you're not going to be able to come up with good solutions. Because the collaboration, the product discovery depends on it. All right, and I already beat this one up, but <laughs> the desire for process, it is super dangerous. And I, I'll, I'll mention one other thing too, which is be very careful about the tools you choose. The tools dictate, typically, dictate specific processes. And it's kind of a sneaky way in. Uh, now, if you agree with the process that it implies, then it's great. But a lot of people will say, well, like a good example is an OKR tool or a roadmap tool. There are very different ways of doing OKRs. There are very different ways of doing roadmaps. If the way that tool prescribes is not how you think you should work, that tool's going to do way more damage than good. This is why, the, honestly, the best teams I know, their tools are Google Docs. <laughs> they're, like, they're like, we don't want that. We don't want to go in that direction. So many of the roadmap tools, all they really do is count up how many people request each feature and let you prioritize that way, which good teams will tell you is the exact opposite way you want to work. So be careful of the tools. They are a back doorway of getting you to follow a process. Say a little louder, please. Could you comment on the differences between, I mean, there's, there must be a difference between commercial products and services versus industrial and maybe governmental uh, products and services, right? I think what you're asking is, if, if you're in a regulated industry, is this a different answer? Actually, it's regarding your, your observation that uh, Nordic countries are very process-driven. And, and, and the first thought that I have is that uh, I don't find us that performance and market and commercially oriented. I mean, we have very... Uh, stable jobs and, and safe income across the board. Uh, there's not a lot of variation in, 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 in our income. And, and we have a lot of our jobs are in industry and, and, and in governmental work, right? Okay. So, but I, and I get that, but how is, you're asking how that relates to this? Yeah, do you think that there's a difference in the, the, the process focus depending on? where you're actually located in your, I mean. Maybe, but I don't think so. For example, um, Germany is probably the best example of 
I mean, Germany's got great engineering. By the way, so do you, right? I mean, but for whatever reason, um, the, this is a tough one in Germany because there's a real attraction to process. Uh, and so I struggle with that and have. I've been working with teams based especially in Berlin, Hamburg, Munich for years. And this is something that always comes up, is sort of breaking that attraction to process and letting the teams do good work. You also are bringing up another issue that I don't have on either, any of my top 10 lists here, which is what if you take away the profit motive? I mean, like Bezos says that the key to Amazon's success is their hiring, and they believe they hire people who will think like owners and not like employees. Now, he says right up front, he says, by the way, the easiest way to do that is make them owners. We give them, and they do, they give everybody stock options in the company, which if you follow Amazon stock, because that if you meet an Amazon person that was able to afford a house in the US, it's probably because of their stock. And that is that sort of what happens when you take that away is, a, is another question. Now, I don't really think that gets to the transformation question, but it's a good question. I get that from venture capitalists a lot, is that they will say, you know, how do we improve, improve the motivation level, the incentive level at uh, European investments, European startups? And I, I tell them, you need to find a way so that if your teams do well, they benefit. And there are other ways besides stock options to do that. But that's probably a good conversation over a beer. Yeah, uh, and pretty much goes beyond my expertise. I just, I, I can tell you that I do think that motivation factor is very important. You want everybody on your team to really care about the, what they're working on and their customers that are gonna be benefiting from it. And by the way, that's a big part of our job as product people, to give the rest of the team reasons to care. All right, good question. Uh, there is every product team, even great empowered product teams, have some amount of what's called keep the lights on work. This is just the stuff every, you know, implementing GDPR, which seems to be a big backfire here. I mean, it's, boy, has it made it a pain to use the internet. But um, anyway, you know, you're gonna fight the government, you're just gonna put that stuff in there. That's keep the lights on work. And a little bit of that is normal. Too much of that, and teams feel like we can't do anything. We can't do anything meaningful. We're just busy doing these dumb little things, fixing some bugs, doing some performance work, some keep the lights on stuff. So you have to be careful. Normally what we do is on each product team, we watch the backlog, we make sure it doesn't get to, be, if it gets more than about 20, 30% of the work, we usually look at maybe this team is, needs another engineer to balance it out, have things more in balance. Too many initiatives. So instead of the little things, this is the big things. This is those, C those companies that can't focus. And they've got 50 big initiatives going on and everybody's like, oh, you're ridiculous. Have no idea. Um, and this is, a, this is a problem. Now this problem does hit the product teams, but it usually starts at the top. So there's sometimes an intervention needed for that. Too much tech debt. It applies even inside too, because even if the senior leaders provide the, the support for it, a lot of times the teams don't have enough experience to know what they need to do to manage tech debt responsibly. Of course, nobody suggests no tech debt, but if it gets out of hand, it's pretty obvious. And it's easy to tell when a team is just, they, they, everything they try to do instead of normally, what would normally take a few days turns into a few weeks, it's probably what's going on. Too much pressure. This gets to the, the topic. Um, an empowered product team is a lot more pressure than a feature team, in truth. I want to be full honest. Feature teams, honestly, you're given a roadmap of features. You know, you kind of show up at work, you do your thing, go home at night. If the features don't do, you probably didn't really have much hope for those features anyway because you didn't pick them. Some stakeholder did. But if you're given problems to solve, you feel a lot more pressure. You feel like, okay, they've given me the ability to figure this out. I guess I need to figure this out. 
And there is a lot more pressure. And this one, there are people that this is, they don't want it. They don't want the pressure. And I, I, I sympathize with that. Now, I will often tell them, you know, this is, what do you think it means to be held accountable to results, be an empowered product team? And that's kind of what it means. It doesn't equate to hours, like working certain number of hours, but it does, you do feel more pressure on an empowered product team. And to be honest, that's by design. They want us to feel that. They want us to feel like we own it. Like these are our customers. These are our customers' problems. We are going to fix it. That's sort of the whole idea of empowering teams. So it is more pressure. And occasionally you have people that uh, just don't want that. So when they understand what's involved in empowered product teams, they can sometimes opt out. Similarly, it's a lot of work. It's, it's more work. Um, you know, you're taking more responsibility. Now, again, that doesn't translate directly to more hours, but it does translate to more stress. Between the work and the pressure, I think it's fair to say it's more stress. And this is one that comes up a lot. And this is what kind of makes it real for a lot of teams, uh, is that they will say, look, here's the thing. We are willing to sign up for outcomes for the things we can control. But we're kind of nervous about signing up for outcomes that maybe depend on sales changing something they do, or marketing, or anybody else. But in fact, the, the guy who invented OKRs, Andy Grove, he invented them the way he did because he wanted this to be the case. He wanted, his argument is, who's got more ability to impact things than the product teams, right? I mean, yes, yeah, sales is doing the selling, but imagine you're in sales. What can you do if the product isn't any good? You still have a quota, you still have to sell, but in product, you want, if product is not able to get their products to sell, you want the product team, by design, you want the product manager to go out with sales and figure out why they can't sell the product. That's, the, that's what that's trying to cause us to do. And so you have to get people comfortable being accountable for more than just the things they directly control. I know I've been out on countless sales calls to try to figure out what's going on. We have to figure it out. It might, you know, it could be all kinds of things. Sometimes it's literally, I, I remember one time find, de, re, dealing with the reality that the product was too complicated for sales to sell. Another time it was basically, uh, they, they didn't have reference customers. And so they kept having to, you know, dance in order to get a sale. And that, none of these are good. So you have to go figure out what's going on and then fix it. All right, and finally, outcomes are hard. That's what these last few are kind of all talking at different pieces, but outcomes are hard. Uh, but that's really what good, that's what good product teams are all about, is f figuring out a way to achieve that outcome. Uh, personally, I have never had any satisfaction over just shipping a deliverable. Uh, it's not meaningful, especially today. You know, early on, we used to release every year, or sometimes every 18 months, then it may be every couple, you know, couple months. But now we release every day. Most good product teams are doing something called continuous delivery. They're doing many little releases every day. You don't have a party every time you do a release. You wait until you've actually accomplished something, an outcome, and then you celebrate that. Yeah? Quantified? Yes. Yeah, all outcomes by definition really, we want them to be quantifiable. So sometimes I get uh, people saying to me, when I ask them to, to make an outcome, they say, okay, we want 10 million downloads, for instance. Okay, well, that's quantifiable. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> I have a real problem with just numbers as outcomes. Oh, well, I mean, this is an OKR discussion. Normally the objective is qualitative, but the key results are quantitative. 
So the objective, and that's what you're really saying, you don't know what the real point was. If it was to say, become the dominant you know, provider in Norway, that's a qualitative thing. And then the key result might be, oh, for us, that means 10 million downloads. Yeah, okay, all right. Okay, I, I think I went a little long, so I apologize that. Uh, I want, but I want to, we got some good questions in there. Um, I will mention Inspired is, many of you probably heard, but that's for product teams, product managers, designers, engineers. Empowered is for product leaders, the leaders of product design, product management, product, and engineering. And then actually today, this shipped from Martina Luchenko, our, yeah. <laughs> Martina is uh, our marketing partner. And so it's literally today came out, uh, I don't know when it, the publishers will make it to all the book retailers, but uh, Amazon shipping today, <laughs> which unfortunately is like 90% of where the books come from. All right, um, so you've got my email, which is here, but I would love to hear your questions. Super useful. So let's open it up. If any, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Uh, Marty, just, just before we jump, voice, yes. voice in the back here. Yes. <clears throat> so we just want to make the questions fair for everyone. We're actually going to turn off the live stream. So people okay. online, unfortunately, you're not going to get the Q&A. But also that means people in the room can ask whatever question they feel like they're asking, they want to ask. I'll run around. We have two mics. I'll run around and give it so everyone can hear. Or you can shout because it's in the room. But uh, feel free to ask questions for Marty. All right, yes. You mentioned the best companies are where the entire company is formed of empowered folks. But at the same time, one of the biggest problems we have is technical debt. Technical debt usually transforms into we have these very specific problems. Let's just fix this thing for the new iOS, for the new Android, for the new TV smartphone, and help us build it. So is it really the entire company has to be empowered? Well, okay, I want to make sure everybody heard the question, and I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, which is, is, is the concept of empowered product teams at odds with the need to address technical debt? Because technical debt is pretty tactical. And, now, and of course, they're not. This is normal. Every company has, in fact, the best practice is that you are always addressing technical debt, minimum 20% of your ca capacity all the time. Product teams are normally doing several things at once. Every good product team. Unless you're really lucky, brand new, you haven't launched anything yet. Then you don't have any tech debt. You don't have any customer issues. I love that phase, but it only lasts a few weeks. And then you're dealing with all this stuff. So uh, what are they? Number one, um, hopefully the majority of your time is the problems you've been asked to solve. Normally it's one, maybe two a quarter, just to give you a calibration. Second, you always have some amount of tech, of, uh, so I will talk about tech debt next. You have some amount of keep the lights on. These are the little things that we do. Like another team needs us to change something for them. It's not a big deal. You're not going to put that in an OKR. You're just going to say, okay, we'll knock that out this week. Or you have a bug, bugs that you need to fix. Uh, you have stuff like that. And then the third category is tech debt. Now, tech debt is sometimes done just by each product team. More often, this, is a, this can turn into a big discussion on how tech debt is handled in big companies, but more often, there is some amount of tech debt work that is done on an ongoing basis by each team. Refactoring would be an example of that. But the big things with technical debt won't be addressed by refactoring. The big things are like, we need an all new architecture or we need to, to move to a more modern programming language. And those things are beyond what one team can do, you know. And so, and so those are also coming out of that. Uh, now that can be done by separate teams, it can be done as a percentage of each team, it could be done every four sprint, there's different ways of handling that. But this is normal. So an empowered product team, even a fully empowered product team, doesn't mean that the only thing you work on is the problems you're trying to solve. So I think that's the direct answer to your question, but yeah. The other thing, you didn't ask this, but it's, it's also fair to say, so for example, Amazon is, in my opinion, one of the best product companies in the world. They just so, they have created an innovation machine. In general, they're a poster child for what I talk about. 
But I, like fairly recently, one of the teams at Amazon reached out to me and they were, they were like, how come our team isn't empowered, but all the teams around us are? They were, literally, that was the question. And I knew one of the teams around them, which is why they called. And I'm like, well, <laughs> there's a couple common reasons. Number one, maybe they don't trust you yet. I mean, because you kind of have to earn that trust, right? If the leaders don't think the product team is really ready for this, they don't want to set them up to fail, and they also don't want to you know, put anybody at risk. The other possibility is sometimes the leader of that group is, doesn't matter they're an empowered company, that's, they're addicted to command and control. They haven't really learned yet. One of the things Amazon does, not to overdo it on them, but very often when they hire people in from the outside into a senior position, you may have heard this already, they usually put that person in at a much lower position. And they tell them, look, yeah, we, our intention is to get you to that vice president position we were, but we want to make sure two things. We want to make sure that you really understand how a good product organization works, and we want to make sure the rest of the people in the organization understand that you understand. And so they'll bring them in at a more junior position and make them show that they really, because they know one of the worst things they could do is bring in a bad leader. And so they're scared of that. And some people will tell me I, I rejected the job because they wanted me to come in as a director, not a vice president. And I'm like, well, this is what they were doing. This is why. But usually they, if the person is good, there's tremendous career opportunity there. Okay, good question. There's one right here. Oh, 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 am I missing? I couldn't see. All right, we'll come back in a There's sec. There's a flying mic already out there. Hi, Marty. Thanks Hi. for your uh, kind words. I'm an engineer, so I was felt very <laughs> uplifted by some of your comments. I'm here with my CEO, so I've got to be a little bit careful. But uh, we're... Um, Parts of what we're struggling with might be that we're, we're partially sales driven. And I'm, I've been thinking lately, and I'm wondering if you could have some comments on how we could move from a sales driven organization to an organization where the sales and the commercial part are an integral part of, of the insight word work that a uh, product needs to succeed. And th this transformation is something that I see that we're struggling with, and I'm wondering if you have some advice. Yeah, well, um Absolutely, they are not incompatible. Most of the happiest salespeople in our industry are working at companies working like I'm describing. Like, who wouldn't want to be a salesperson for Stripe right now? Who wouldn't want to be a salesperson for Shopify right now? I mean, these places are, are they have awesome products. Salespeople are raking in the money. And that's what they want. Salespeople want great products. You have to work with sales in order to do that. The short answer is there is nothing in product you can do. And when I say product, I mean engineering design, product management. Nothing you can do that would be more valuable for your sales partners than providing them referenceable customers. Uh, I get this question so often that I actually remember the chapter. It's chapter 39 in Inspired. <laughs> It goes into depth on the technique that is meant for this. And none of the things I talk about or write about are, are invented by me or SVPG. We just share what we see the best companies using. And the best companies love that technique. And here in front. Yeah, yes. you mentioned this like too much process. And yeah, I mean, you're right. I, I sit in meetings to plan meetings here in Norway. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> Are you seeing anything in America, Silicon Valley, like how are they killing all the process? Like any more examples of this? Yeah, well, <laughs> I want to be clear. I can point to s companies in San Francisco that are totally addicted to process. It's not a San, you know, Silicon Valley rest of the world. It is a danger. That is why, I, in fact, if I... I should have had more quotes from this. If you Google the SVPG, Scaling with process, just that phrase. It'll take you to a recent article where I, sh I got so many of these, got so frustrated with all the process people that I shared nothing but quotes from leaders, great leaders, I mean, whether it's Steve Jobs or th these great leaders about why they were so scared 
about process. All of them. When Jeff Bezos talks about day one and day two organizations, day one is like when you act like a startup. Day two is when you act like a bank or when you act like a telco. You know, it's like you're dead. That's what you want to avoid. And he says, you know, what does day two look like? Process takes over. And he's constantly worried about that. Steve Jobs, when that, he, there was an amazing interview that was done in 1995 after he had been kicked out of Apple, uh, his own company, and he had been working at Next, and they had interviewed him for a documentary. And the documentary was some dumb documentary. They used a few minutes of this interview. But then the tape of the full interview was lost. It was lost in shipping back to the US. And uh, after he died, the producer found the tape, a copy of the tape in his garage. And he, he realized by this point, you know, Steve Jobs had rebuilt Apple into the most valuable company in the world. He realized he was looking at, they didn't even appreciate what they had. It was one of the few real interviews that he had given about how you build great products. And it was public, they, they published it. It's called The Lost Interview. And you can find it on Amazon. <laughs> it's funny, you can find it everywhere except Apple. <laughs> Can't find it there. But uh, it's called The Lost Interview. It's 70 minutes of absolute gold. He talks, I mean, it's like a master class in product. And one of the things he talks about is like, I was, I'm really getting nervous watching Apple about they're getting, they're falling into that process trap. He can see it. I mean, obviously he had a bone to pick. He, he pointed out why uh, Scully was a terrible hire, uh, and he was. He points out, you know, sales and marketing people are not the right people to lead a product company. He knows that now. Um, and then he points out the disease, his words, the disease of process people. And uh, he talks about, look, there's content and there's process. Content has to be number one. His word for the product has to be number one. Process should support that. He's like, the, the system at Apple is there is no system. That's kind of the magic. And he says, literally, it's not that there's no process, it's just that process is in support of this. But he was worried that process was growing too strong. And uh, literally, I mean, Elon Musk, in typical fashion, is harsher than he was. But he's like, you know, process becomes a substitute for thinking. And um, he's, you know, all of the great leaders are scared of process. They have seen this happen as companies get large. Because fundamentally, there's only two ways that I've ever seen that companies can scale. One is with process, and you've heard what I think about that, but the other is with leaders. And in every case of the good product companies I know, they believe in scaling with leaders, scaling with people. Uh, when I say people, the leaders. The leaders. This is another common misunderstanding about Agile. People think that when you move to Agile, or more generally, when you move to empowered teams, it means that you need less leadership. In fact, people, will, you know, sometimes those Agile coaches that are not helping will come into a company and say, look, uh, your managers, back off. Let your people do their thing. Give them space. It couldn't be less helpful. In an empowered organization, you don't need less leadership, you need better leadership. It's harder to be a leader of an empowered organization. It's much easier to do command and control. But that the re if you really are interested in this topic, there's a new book out by Reed Hastings, the co-founder of Netflix. And the book is called No Rules, Rules. And of all the companies I know that, you know, pretty much the needle on empowerment is very high. Uh, those are the, that's why I think they're great companies, but they, Netflix sets it all the way to 11. Netflix is all the way. And he describes in this book why they believe that, why they believe this works better. And it's all about pushing decisions down to the teams, not making decisions for the teams, but pushing them down. And in order to do that, you have to provide the teams what's called the strategic context the product vision, the product strategy, the team topology, the objectives. You need to provide them the context so that they can make good decisions. Because you know, if you've got 50 product teams, 
in your, let's say your Shibstead and you've got, I don't know, probably a lot more than 50 product teams. That's a huge company. But uh, let's say you've got 50 product teams all contributing into one product. You need to make sure you're not going in 50 different directions. In fact, that's probably what would happen if you don't have leadership playing an active role. And that's engineering leadership. That's definitely design leadership because it's going to be one experience at the end of the day for your customers. And product leadership. So this is a common misunderstanding. Uh, and I think the Agile people inadvertently, I mean, I hear so much, I know, I'm not here to beat up on the Agile coaches, but you know, one of the things I keep seeing is that since they've never worked in product companies, they say things like, they tell every product manager, you're supposed to do a product vision for your team. Think about that for five seconds. Ask yourself if that makes any sense. If you've got 50 product teams, do you really want 50 product visions? Do you really want 50 product strategies? <laughs> it makes zero sense. And so, of course, this is the more general issue. You really, I didn't talk enough about this. It's sort of another talk. But the most important thing your leaders do is coach and develop their people. I love seeing this. I don't know if you've seen there's a set of commercials that Microsoft is running. By the way, Microsoft's a great example of a turnaround. They had made the same mistake Apple did. They hired a salesperson as their CEO, Bomber. And then they finally replaced with a product person, Satya, who's been doing an amazing job turning it around. But uh, Satya does this. He's basically making a commercial trying to tell you why you should come work for Microsoft again. They're good again, is what he's trying to say. But he says their managers are, have three jobs, and one of those jobs is coaching. He's emphasizing coaching. Google, constantly emphasizing coaching. Apple, their leaders have four jobs. Coaching is one of them. So good companies understand that this is critical. People aren't born knowing this stuff. I was lucky. I had somebody to coach me all along. You know, every, I didn't, the first 10 years of my career was uh, as a developer at HP Labs. It was a great place to learn to be an engineer. But every single day of those 10 years, I had at least one person assigned to help me get better at my job. I thought that was normal. Then, of course, you went out to the broader world and you meet people. I meet people all the time that I, they tell me what they think product is, and I'm like, who taught you that? And the answer is nobody. <laughs> nobody taught them. They went to a CSPO class. Is here, yes, please. Um, do I have some? Yes. I used to be an agile coach. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I'm, uh, I'm in a better place, I'm in product. You're recovered. I'm, I'm recovered, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to say thanks a lot for a great talk. I'm, I'm a huge fan of your writing. I, I actually thought this was going to be a digital thing, so I'm kind of starstruck right now that you're actually here. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, with my uh, ex-Agile coach uh, friends, we actually did discuss, because we were one of those management people that were hired to do a transformation. <laughs> yeah. And my question to you, or if you could elaborate a little bit, should we even do transformations? Um, that's a process, right? It's, or it's a project. It's like getting oh, it's from A to B. Sh should we even do transformations like that? Well, I believe that most companies, if they don't transform, they are in trouble. I don't know if it's this year or 10 years from now, but I believe they need to transform. And most need help to do it. So to me, the real question is, can that, those companies find good help really for that? I will tell you that I think this is a shortage all over the world of people, including and in, especially in the US. There are not enough. Uh, you know, I was telling this to Lisa. Some of you may know Lisa here but uh, just before. But there's only five of us at SVPG. We're booked out until 2023. So when people call, we're useless. And what we need is more people to be able to say, oh, go talk to this person. They've been there, done that, and they can help you. We are trying an experiment, actually, next month in London. We're going to be doing our, trying to, it's called Coach the Coaches. It's a special thing. We've got people from Norway and 20 other countries across Europe that are coming. We're, we're trying to help develop more people that can help. 
just because we don't have enough people that we can refer in. It's just like anything else. There are good people. and I'm not, I always tell the, the companies, make sure it's somebody that's been there, done that. They know what they're talking about. Just like, to me, I would never send my product managers to be trained by somebody that's never done product management. Check out the backgrounds of the people teaching the product owner courses. You'll see what I mean. I would never send a designer to a class unless it was somebody who really had done great design. Same thing as anything else. And so similarly, it, there's uh, discovery coaches that help teams learn how to do product discovery. There's product leadership coaches that help them learn how to do things like a good product strategy, a good team topology. And there are transformation coaches that can help work at all levels, especially that C-suite, to help them succeed. So, uh, to, you know, I believe if there's a real need for that. Sure. Hi. Uh, oh. I can repeat it if you want. Hi. Uh, this actually ties a little bit into that. Uh, I'm asking purely uh, as a personal thing. I'm moving from a product organization that pretty much has what you describe as empowered teams. Okay. I'm moving to an agency, uh, a design agency, and setting up product for them. Uh, so how can I bring those principles that we did really well at my organizations into an agency? Is there a good model of going from the transformation and actually into the product work as a consultant or as an agency uh, and, and still maintaining that uh, ownership? Like, I'm do they you. always hate us or can <sighs> we like work together? One follow-up question though before you yeah. lose the microphone. Um, is it an agency that does engineering, design or product or all? Yeah, all, uh, but historically uh, stronger in the design uh, side of it, and my job is now to bring that into more, to follow that product a bit longer than okay. just like letting it into the wild. No, so it's a good question, and honestly, it's a really common one all over, because a lot of agencies are trying to move upstream and provide more value. Because if you're, you know, a classic design agency, there's really good designers at those places, but they're usually very frustrated because they're implementing a bad design from some person that's not even really a product person. They're just like, give me this. And so it can be very sort of demoralizing. And so they want to move up and like, let us help you with the bigger issue. Now, the truth is, you have to, there's only a few agencies I know that have proven that they can get that trust. Because it really is trust with your client. Well, IDEO is a good example. They were one of the first. Uh, but there are more today. And th these are agencies that are basically established a relationship with their client that they can say, you know, we could do that, but you don't really want us to do that. You want us to solve this problem for you. So it, you have to worry because some companies will just say, look, if you don't want to do it, Accenture will do anything. <laughs> Hi, that, um, Hi. Thank you for the talk. Um, I work for a company. We build hardware and software for the energy industry here in Norway and around the world. And the whole company is more and more keen to, to, to go full product driven. And luckily, my, our CPO is here next to me. <laughs> um, and we, we, we like all the, all the ideas and are trying to implement them. But our, our business model is based on tenders, and tenders tend to pop up every two months, generally through, through sales, with a whole list of requirements of what we need to, to build to, get, to win the tender. Yeah. So is, it, is that a, a case that you're familiar with? Or any advice on how we can uh, manage product being product-driven? Yeah, sense? no, this is a tough one for sure. Um, tenders are in the U.S. We call them RFPs. You know, the, these are. So here's the thing: product companies and custom solution companies. Product companies do one thing: sell to thousands, millions, whatever you know the size of the organizations are. Custom solution companies, which, by the way, is that's what Accenture is 
really for, and that's what I recommend them all the time for that, they are set up to do these one-off custom solutions. So the real question is, your customers, do they want a one-off custom solution or do they really want a general solution? Now, I don't know, you would have to answer that. If they really want a general solution but they don't know how to ask for it, <laughs> especially like one of the reasons I hate working with telcos is they always want to do tenders, even though they're not nearly as special as they think they are. But they always want to do that. And in some companies, they have, like literally when I was at HP, which at the, when I was there, they were considered sort of the Google of the industry. They were the most consistently innovative company. The, the CEO or the co-founder, Dave Packard, made a rule that says, we do not do tenders. We do not. If you want to buy one of our off-the-shelf products, we would love to sell it to you. And by the way, he said that to the government of the US. He said, we are not going to do it. Uh, because it won't be the solution you want and it's not our business. And uh, he got away with it. But I, you know, in a, lot, a smaller place, maybe he wouldn't be able to. So this is a business strategy decision. You can have an amazing business as a custom solution product. Do you guys know Accenture is valued basically what Oracle is? It's an incredibly valuable company and it's a custom solution provider. So they, what they've done is got very good at delivering custom solutions. So I'm not saying don't do that. This is a business strategy thing that you have to decide. But if you decide you want it to be a general product company, you will probably need to change some practices. Sure. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, you talked a lot about the, the, the Guardian example, five people oh. developing an app. and uh, but. What if your problem requires hardware to solve the sure. problem? How would you, can you say anything, or do you have any examples of how to structure a team? Oh yeah, I mean, I, I loved, partly you heard, I started my career at a device company. <laughs> so I love devices, hardware, software, firmware, apps. I love it, I love that whole ecosystem. So there are some differences, of course. Um, mainly, the biggest difference is when you look, product discovery is all about risk, right? Like, where are the risks? In a, hard, in a device, the risks are way higher because the cost of screwing up is way worse, right? In software, we can, we can always do a patch tomorrow, really, if it gets down to it. Hardware, it could literally kill the company. So because, in fact, of all the companies I've ever been in, the company does, does more prototypes than anybody else easily is Apple, because they know this. They're doing a small number of multi-billion dollar devices. So they, um, they have to get them right. And so they prototype like crazy. Discovery there. The discovery for the first iPhone was three and a half years. Normally for software thing, maybe three months, maybe three weeks, depending on what it is. Three and a half years of discovery for the first iPhone. And it would have gone longer, but they finally figured out a way to handle text entry. And so uh, that's, you know, that's, it's all based on outcome. Like they, they had learned what happens if you ship a product that's not ready. Do you remember the Newton? The Newton failed because, and their own, they knew why it failed. It was too hard to enter text. So that was the thing they were most nervous about with the first iPhone. And uh, it wasn't until they felt like now we have a good solution for entering text that they actually took that to market. So. Uh, not all hardware devices, like if you look at a Peloton or if you look at a Fitbit or something like that, it's, we're not talking three and a half years. But, so it's still hard. There are, there are discovery coaches that specialize in devices. My favorite one is a guy named Tom Chi. You can Google him. Uh, he, he used to work at Google X where they did all their devices for a while and now he's... So there's definitely people that specialize in it. The concepts are the same. It's just the risks are higher. So things that we can kind of get away with in software, you can't get away with. Sure. The mic, please. Yeah, there's one last question. Sure. In the corner. Yeah, I'm going to try to not use the word process for this one. Oh, there, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. Oh no, where's um, the person? So. 
Oh, hi. <laughs> so usually when I speak to C-suite people and um, they're trying to describe what's wrong with the company, why they're subperforming, they usually point to that we don't have the right people, which they hired. <laughs> Uh, and uh, also that it's difficult to get uh, good quality candidates because the jobs are not very exciting. So um, I, I like the first 15 pages of, of, uh, of your book where you basically describe most product development processes in most companies I've seen. So how do you uh, change the C-suite's attitudes towards how they view their own jobs and responsibilities to affect that change that they say that they want. Yeah. Well, I would argue that they're right and that it usually does boil down to people. Um, in fact, my partner, Christian Idioti, if you've ever have a chance to hear him in a talk, he is captivating. He's one of the best. In fact, the reason he's, he's not only personally led major transformations at two major companies, but he is also known as the best product coach I've ever met. And he likes to say, look, fundamentally all problems are people problems. Now, the difference is I would tell those leaders that, uh, you know, well, certainly what you already observed, they hired these people, so they need to step up. But really the issue, the way you address that is your, your managers. They're Ben Horowitz, you guys know Ben Horowitz? He's a partner at Andreessen Horowitz. He's, I, I worked with him at Netscape, probably one of the very best product people I've ever seen, and then he became one of the best CEOs I've ever seen, and then he became one of the best investors. But Ben likes to say, he likes to argue that the most important role, most important non-C-level role in a tech product company is your managers of product managers. And his argument is this. Look, your products are only as good as the product teams that create them. But product teams are only as good as their product manager. Who is the person at your company that you hold accountable for having strong product managers? your manager of product managers, or director product management, whatever you call that first level manager. His argument is that's the people that you need to get to right there. And I think in my years, I've seen he's exactly right. Unless that's where you gotta go, that's who you have to hold accountable. Those are the people that are going to recruit, and those are the people that are going to coach. And unless they know what they're doing, what do you expect? But if they know what they're doing and they're held accountable for that, that's how you raise the bar. In fact, I'll, uh, I'll share a few other things I've, I share with people. I tell product leaders, many of you I think are product leaders, chief product officers, whatever the title is here, VP of product, but I tell them that you will be judged by your weakest product manager. Because it's really true. When I talk to CEOs, when I ask about their product management, they immediately zero in on the weakest product manager. So I t that's, who, that's how you're gonna be judged, by your weakest product manager. So you need to make sure that you don't have weak product managers. It is a high bar for that. The other thing I say is to the CEOs, I say, and by the way, you should know who your product managers are by name. And you should believe that each of them has the potential to be a future leader of your company. If you don't believe that's possible with this person, it's probably the wrong person. Doesn't mean they're ready this year to be promoted to senior vice president, but it does mean that like that person has potential. So it's a high bar. You heard me say, I think it was the number one thing for internally, raise the bar on your product managers. It's really not that hard either. If, their man if your manager is coaching you on how to be a good product manager is not that hard. It takes normally two to three months to take somebody that has the raw materials and, and get them to be competent as a product manager. What does that mean? They have to, like, uh, all right, uh, do we have time? Are we okay? Because I get carried away on this topic for sure. 
But when I, I so my, uh, my story is pretty much as rough as you're going to find, so it's a good example. But I was an engineer, and then I went through HP's engineering leadership training program, which was an amazing program. Uh, and that's really why... Uh, I joined the company is to go through this and become, I wanted, I mean, you know, I was trained as an engineer. I wanted to be, write, build, and be a CTO. But anyway, after I reached sort of the engineering manager, I, I realized that, you know what, product is really the bigger problem. And I wanted to learn product. And so um, my manager was the VP of engineering. He said, I can't teach you product. But the way it worked there was... Um, you would get somebody else to coach the person. And he reached out to a different person who had actually started four different product divisions at HP. He was in another state, so we did this all virtually, but he, he agreed to coach me. The first thing he asked me was, look, I said, I'm willing to spend the time, but you have to be willing to invest to, get, to, to learn these things. He wouldn't do anything until I, said, I told him, I absolutely want to learn this, just tell me what I need to do. So I was, um, I, sh I should mention all of uh, the products I had been an engineer on and engineering manager were products for developers. And I was going to need, they had agreed to let me be the product manager as well as the engineering manager for this next product, which was another product for developers. So uh, he started asking me, he basically did an assessment of me in our first couple calls. The first thing he said was, you know, I want to understand if you understand the customers. And I actually said, hey, I've been, a, the customers are developer. I've been a developer for several years. I feel like I got that. He said, well, all I know for sure is that's never true. And so he, he literally said, just so you know, you're not going to be allowed to make a single decision for your product team until after you visit 30 customers. 30, 3 zero. 15 in the US, 15 in Europe. It was my first trip to Europe, actually. And, uh, and I will tell you that that changed my world. First of all, I learned right away that he was right, that the developers at HP were not the same as the developers at Walmart, the developers at FedEx, the developers at Deutsche Telekom. These were all in my first batch. Anyway, so that was big. He knew I didn't know my customers. And that had to be fixed. The second thing he asked is, do you understand HP's go-to-market? Go-to-market is basically how do your products get from the lab, from the developers, into the hands of your real customers? Like, I had no, honestly, I had no idea. I, you know, obviously we, we had ways you could buy them, but I didn't know how it was really done. And he said, so when you go on, he arranged, by the way, the same trip, um, he, he two I think it was two week-long business trips, one in the U.S., one in Europe, and he said he arranged salespeople that were going to uh, go with me on these and at the same time teach me about the sales channel. It was a direct sales organization. I learned about sales. I learned about marketing. I learned about tech sales. I learned about all these different roles. I didn't even know what they did. I didn't even know what the titles meant before I did this. But I had to learn the whole go-to-market chain. Another thing he asked me, this was, this was one I knew I didn't know. But he said, how much do you know about the financial analytics? And I, I do remember specifically, he asked me, do I know what LTV st stood for? And I did know that. I, I, lifetime value, I got one question right. And he said, um, good, well, how is lifetime value defined for your product? <laughs> oh my God. I was like, don't even pretend. You know, I had no idea. And he said, look, you know, and he asked me a few more questions about the analytics. You know, I was, I was an engineer. I didn't know anything about the analytics. I didn't know anything about whether, what this product cost. I didn't know what it cost to sell. I didn't know what, how much we made. I didn't know about its contribution. None of that. So he said, I'm going to do two things on that because that's going to take some work. The first is I'm going to send you a book that you need to read which was basically a basic book on financial accounting. I had never even had a finance course in college, which I'm embarrassed to admit, but it was true. I never had a course. It's not that hard to learn, but I had never tried. And the other thing he did was he said he, he called a friend in the finance group for the division I was in. I was in the research lab. And that person agreed to tutor me in the analytics. So he wanted me to understand all of the different KPIs and really two things, what they meant and then also 
were they any good? Literally for our products, like is this a good number? Is that a bad number? I, there, I had no way to judge. You know, is $7 a reasonable cost for something? Anyway, that happened. So I didn't know anything about the customers. I didn't know anything about the finances. I didn't know anything about the go-to-market. I really didn't know anything about product. But in about three months, he told, you know, the way it worked at HP and in a lot of big companies is every quarter, the executives sort of do what's called an exec review. Basically, they want to see the status of the product team. And that was sort of my first debut wearing this product hat. And he told me that just so you know, they're going to judge you. They, said, they, don't, they don't really care about your product. They care about you. They said they know that if you don't know what you're doing, what's the chance the engineers are going to build anything useful? That's literally what he told me. So he said that you're going to be judged. So you better prepare. <laughs> and I was nervous enough to begin with, but I, I prepared. I did what he said. There's some, some other techniques, um, especially that's the first time I did a written narrative, which is a great technique, but to make sure you, you really have thought through harder questions. But anyway, I did that exec review, and afterwards he told me they were fine. He said they're not worried about your team. And that's... That's just because I had prepared. That took a quarter. It's not that hard. And that, most people are starting from a much better place than I was starting from, right? I mean, I had a little bit, I mean, I had interest in the area. I knew about tools, but that was really as much as I had going for me. So a good, he was being a manager. He was coaching me. That's his job. And luckily, I had several people through my career that did that to help me learn and get ready for the next level. And I, I really do feel for so many people have never had anybody that did that for them. That's just, that's just wrong. And I love that you know, good companies understand this because that's how they learned. So that was long-winded, but <laughs> hopefully that was useful to sort of wrap this whole thing up. And it's good to end on a positive note, not all the reasons transformations will fail, right? All right, anyway, I really appreciate everybody coming. I hope this was useful. And feel free to email me if you um, have questions that you didn't get a chance to ask. Are we good, guys? I think uh, you deserve both a gift, Marty, but first of all, a big applause.